glorified God. Let's read on a little further. And the ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation because that Jesus had healed on the Sabbath day and said unto the people, There are six days in which men ought to work. In them, therefore, come and be healed, and not on the Sabbath day. Think about this. Think about this. You know, I, I was in church, uh, actually in a church in Carson City one Sunday morning, and the preacher was, was uh, preaching, the pastor was preaching, and uh, he was preaching along there, and uh, someone drew his attention to there was a lady in the congregation that was really sick. And you know what he did? He stopped his message. He prayed for her. And then he went back to finish his message up. Amen. Was he out of order? No, no he was not out of order. You know what? Christianity is not about a form and rituals and things like that. But it's about ministering to people and caring and, and, uh, and, and the Lord working in people's lives. Uh, so let's... Uh, Let's read a little further. Verse 15. The Lord then answered him. That's this man that wanted him to heal on six days, but not on the Sabbath. The Lord then answered him and said, Thou hypocrite, doth not each one of you on the Sabbath day loose his ox or his ass from the stall and lead him away to watering? Now, really grasp what's going on here. And ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan hath bound low these 18 years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day? Amen. In other words, you know what Jesus was telling this man? You think more of your animals than you do people. That's right. You've got more compassion for your animals. You take care of them, and that's work. Uh, I, I, I think it's so interesting when you look at the idea of uh, healing on the Sabbath and so forth and uh, or working on the Sabbath and, and, uh, and all this. There was one incident actually where they got on Jesus' case about uh, uh, healing on the Sabbath and he told him, he said, uh, now wait a minute, he said, I know you're zealous about, and I'm paraphrasing of course, I know you're zealous about not working on the Sabbath, but he said, let me just ask you this. In the Mosaic Law, the Bible also, the, the Word also says, in the Mosaic Law, that you are to circumcise your son when he's eight days old. Now, what about his eighth day falls on Sabbath? Then, are you going, going to work on the Sabbath to circumcise your boy? Or are you going to violate the teachings of the law in order to keep the Sabbath? Well, that's quite a quandary, isn't it? Mm -hmm. What do you do in a case like that? See, the, the, the bottom line is we cannot achieve righteousness through the keeping of laws and ordinances and so forth. And Jesus made that very clear. Uh, verse 17, I want to read that here. It says, When he had said these things, all his adversaries were ashamed, and all the people rejoiced for all the, the glorious things that they had done, that, had, that were done by him. So the people that was listening, they was rejoicing. They was, uh, they was glad that Jesus uh, was, had compassion for people and was healing people and so forth. So I've talked about laying hands on the sick, that they... Uh, that they would be healed and that's part of the Christian doctrine of laying hands on on the sick now laying on of hands now we turn to the book of Acts chapter 8 and I'm going to read verses 14 through 17 it says now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God they sent unto them Peter and John who when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as yet he, had, he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then laid they their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. And you know what? I've, I've actually seen this happen in church services. 
where people was, was seeking to be filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost, and you lay hands on them, and God would fill them with the Holy Ghost. I, uh, it, it's, uh, uh, it, it's just something. Uh, why did God choose laying on of hands? Why do you, have you ever thought about that? Why is it that, uh, that God wants us to lay hands on people when they're sick and pray for them and, and, uh, and so forth and lay hands on them to receive the Holy Ghost and, and whatever? Why would God do that? You know what I believe? I believe that God uh, promotes within the body of Christ personal relationship between one another, between people, Christian people. He wants us to be part of one another. He wants us to be personal with one another and be aware of, of people's needs and, and, uh, and minister to people's needs uh, and so forth. So uh, he chose laying on his hands as a personal touch, a personal contact uh, with people. And I, I, I just believe that's very important. I, you know what I, what I see happening uh, uh, in, uh, in, in a lot of churches, and I see it more nowadays than I used to, and I think it's a great thing, and that's when people uh, hug one another. Uh, you know, I think that's a good thing. I really do. Now, I, I know that uh, it can, can, the enemy, our enemy, can use this in the wrong way, and we need to be careful of that, of course, and, uh, and so forth, but uh, we need to keep our hearts pure and and, uh, and so forth, and just have godly love one for another, which uh, I believe the, the, the uh, hugging one another is, is a good thing, and it's, uh, it causes us to be closer to one another and, and, and feel more like a part of one another. The next thing I want to talk about it's, has a little, uh, has a different view of laying on of hands, okay? Uh, but, but it's still scripture, and it's still part of the, the subject that I'm talking about this morning. And so, as we look at the Word of God, here we find in the, in the book of Acts, chapter 13, verses 2 and 3, the Bible says, As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed, they laid hands on them. They sent them away. So when they sent these two men out to, to, uh, to do evangel evangelistic work, they prayed for them and they laid their hands on them. And, you know, we do this and when we anoint people uh, into the ministry and so forth. This is a practice that is practiced in probably most Christian churches. Uh, and so uh, they laid their hands on them. Now, let's look at 1 Timothy 5 uh, and 22. And we find an interesting scripture. It says, lay hands suddenly on no man. Lay hands suddenly on no man. Neither be partaker of men, other men's sins. Keep thyself pure. You know what I believe this scripture is talking about? I believe when it's talking about laying hands on people, it's talking about endorsing their ministry and so forth. And I want to, I want to just uh, uh, be candid with you this morning. And I'll tell you that's, that's one mistake that I have, that I have made uh, in, in my ministry and in pastoring is I have laid hands too soon on people. I have had people put people in positions in church and, uh, and, and, and let them function as leadership uh, in the church before I got to know them well enough and got to really understand and know. Uh, in, in, uh, in 1 Thessalonians 5 and 12, the Bible says, We beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you. Now, I, I think you can take this two ways. See, I believe that the saints ought to know who the leadership in the church are, know who that they can, uh, uh, can uh, depend on and so forth. I, I recall a message I heard preached once at a conference where a man talked of, used this scripture and he said, know them which labor among you. And he said, uh, he said if I have a, 
a, a, a, a, a situation in the church. He said, in my church, he said, if, if I have a lot of people come to the church that's not saved, and they're not getting saved, he said, I would go, I would call brother so-and-so, and he named a minister, and he said, I would have him come and preach a revival for me because he really excels in evangelism. Now, he said, if I had a problem in my church where he said uh, there was a problem with church government in the church, and I remember the minister he named, he said, I would call for Brother Anderson. And he said, uh, Brother Anderson, he said, I have a lot of confidence in this area, and I'd have him come and preach on church government. And he said, if I had uh, a situation, another situation, I'd call on Brother, and he named six or seven things, he said, and, and he named ministers, and he said, uh, I, because he said, I know them that labor among us, and I know who I can call on for certain situations. So he said, know them that labor among you. But you know what? I think another proper way to look at this scripture is before we have Peter, people in leadership in a church, I think we need to know them, and we need to know the kind of life they live, uh, and so forth. Now, let's look at 1 Timothy chapter 3 verses 1 through 7 listen to what this says this morning uh and 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 i i i tell you what i have to really look close at this uh when i think about this and when you know the bible says to uh examine yourself and see whether you be in the faith well sometimes i find myself examining myself and listen to what this says so this is a true saying, if a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. Now that's what we call pastor nowadays, okay? A bishop then must be blameless. That's a big order within itself, isn't it? Mm -hmm. A bishop must be blameless. The husband of one wife. Well, some people say, well, if a man's been married more than once, that he can't be a pastor. That's not what this is talking about. This is talking about, says that a man, if he's a bishop, he cannot be practicing polygamy. He must be the husband of one wife. Uh, he must be vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, no greedy of filthy liqueur, in other words, money, uh, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous. Well, that's a whole lot of list of things that uh, as qualifications for a preacher, isn't it? Uh, as we were saying in our Wednesday night Bible study, I, uh, was it this last Wednesday or the week before, that uh, ministers actually are called to a higher standard than everybody else in the church. Because we, need, we have to be the example to the flock, and uh, so we are called to a higher standard. Verse 5 is one that I really like to look at, and I've seen a lot of pastors come short in this area. Uh, and and, I, and I, I try not to be critical, uh, and, and I know sometimes it's really difficult to, to uh, live up to all, all things. Uh, but still, the word is the word, and we should be striving to the very best of our ability to live by the word and live up to the things that the Bible teaches. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? To be a pastor, you have to have your family in order. And you know what? I, I Like I say, I've seen a... a, a I've known a couple pastors that didn't qualify for the office because of that. So this is something that we need to, to uh, really take a look at. And, and then it says in verse 6, not a novice. Well, what is a novice? A novice is somebody that's inexperienced, isn't it? Okay, how do you get experience without, without doing the job? So... I, I tell you how you do that. You sit in a church and you faithfully uh, attend church and practice the teachings of the Word of God and you learn from them that are in charge and you become a seasoned minister and then you're qualified to, uh, to take the office of the 
head bishop uh, within the church. So not a novice, lest being, enough, being lifted up with pride, he fall into the con.